most of you don't know Lance. Would you introduce yourself a little bit to everybody? Tell what you do for a living and what you have done as a writer. Sure. If we're getting into it, I will. Yeah, sure. Okay. Right uh, hi, my name is Lance Arthur Smith. Uh, I've had the pleasure of being uh, a writer in residence kind of here and also at the Army and Navy Academy uh, through Jack and Bell becoming uh, their sponsorship. And a lot of the projects uh, that I work on are, are historical in nature. Uh, so when Jack approached the Village Arts uh, with the prospect of doing a play or some sort of uh, some sort of dramatization of Glenn's life, uh, Christine Kerner, the artistic director, knew that I had an affinity for history. I loved it, and that it might be something on my office. So she asked me if I would be willing to take a look at it and, and talk to Jack and talk to Glenn and see if it was something that I would want to do. And of course, you know, Jack is very enthusiastic and Glenn is very um, laid back. Laid back. <laughs> shall we say. You know, Glenn Glenn has this this aura of, well, I didn't do much. Well, uh, you know, I did a little of this, a little of that. And then the longer you talk to the man, as I'm sure you all know, because you get to talk to him uh, every day. Uh, the more you peel those layers back, uh, to use the orange, or to use an onion, uh, the sweeter it gets. Would you rather get an orange or an onion? Uh, it's up to you, Glenn. <laughs> the more stories you, you get out of Glenn, and, and that's when the magic happens. That's, for me, as a writer, uh, I'm a writer and I'm an actor, but getting to talk to someone like Glenn, uh, and really starting to delve into those stories and find out how he felt about them, uh, not just sort of a cursory glance at Glenn's life, but really getting to who he is, uh, what he felt about what he was working on. That is what sparks me uh, as an actor and as a writer. So that's a little bit about me. I don't, he's not playing Glenn. He's not acting Glenn. He's no, he just, Glenn. he just is. Glenn just is. Yeah. Uh, Glenn, maybe you could add something here by telling him a little bit about what you did on the Hold that mic up. What, what did you do at, at, there in Tennessee? Hold the mic up. What did I do uh, during my career? Uh, Old Ridge? Is the sure, Old Ridge. <clears throat> well, at uh, Old Ridge, Tennessee, uh, is there anyone here who uh, hasn't heard of Old Ridge, Tennessee? Well, at the time I went to Oak Ridge, Tennessee, it was a uh, converted uh, cow pasture down in that area. It so sits in a uh, green valley a uh, uh, few miles uh, south of uh, Knoxville. And uh, at the, the time that I went there, I was working at the uh, University of California in uh, Berkeley in the radiation laboratory. And uh, I was approached one day and said, uh, uh, we'd like you to uh, get your stuff together and uh, we have an outing for you. And uh, so it turned out that uh, I was given directions to go to uh, uh, Knoxville, Tennessee, and then uh, go out on a, a road that will take you down to uh, a little town of Clinton. And uh, it was small. There were uh, several storefronts there. And my destination was a storefront in uh, Clinton, uh, Tennessee. So I walked up to the store. They told me what to look for. Uh, on the window, there's just a little sticker that says Clinton Engineering Works. And uh, so when I walked into Clinton Engineering Works, uh, I walked into a new world. And <clears throat> there wasn't anything like uh, the other storefronts along the street. But uh, this was my uh, the place where I was uh, briefed on uh, where I was going to go and what I was going to do. And uh, 
From there, uh, I was uh, escorted to Through the Gates of Oak Ridge, Tennessee. And at that time, uh, Oak Ridge uh, was coming to life. Uh, they had uh, just installed board sidewalks to keep you out of the mud. And uh, they had uh, recently established a uh, laundry at the little town site and at the time I got there they didn't have anyone to offer me laundry. But uh, <clears throat> that's another story. <laughs> but uh, anyway, uh, my uh, pretty little wife and I uh, didn't have a place to live so they were saying a two-story um, barracks building. And uh, uh, we were on the bottom floor, and uh, right above us uh, was a, one of the scientists called uh, Edward Teller. He uh, lived on the second floor. And we got pretty well acquainted. And uh, eventually, uh, <clears throat> I was at work one day, they took us out to uh, the job site. And uh, I was accustomed to uh, uh, nuclear facility as we knew them then, which was a strictly radiation laboratory. And uh, I was amazed at uh, how far science had uh, come uh, in just a few years. But anyway, that's the way my start was at Oak Ridge, Tennessee. Well, there was a good, uh, a modest uh, start. And the rest is, uh, as you might have heard, the rest is history. <laughs> um, what you led us, leading up to, I suppose, you were a machinist, you were machining metal parts for what became the atom bomb, right? What became, what? What became the atomic bomb? You were machining metal parts to make it yes. fit and it work. The trigger yes. the mechanism and so on. Right. Okay. So you were telling this to Lance, and this inspired you to write the play. It did. Uh, this one and other things. Uh, Lance's story coupled with uh, an interview I did with Ellery Rogers uh, talking about her husband Max. Uh, do all of you know Elizabeth uh, Rogers, who lives in that uh, assisted living area? Yeah. Okay. So as part of my interview process, I interviewed Glenn, I interviewed Ella. Um, as the story took shape, it, uh, I used predominantly Glenn's story, although there are still elements of Ella's story in there. What was her involvement? Her involvement, uh, actually, she went there, she knew very little about what was going on. Her husband, Max, worked in security. And one of his primary responsibilities towards the end of the Manhattan Project was to actually transport the enriched uranium across state lines. So he was, you know, like, like the old spy movies, he was handcuffed to a briefcase that had this enriched uranium in it. He had a dosimeter on, uh, much like Glenn wore every day in the lab because Glenn was exposed to, or could have been exposed to some of this stuff. Uh, but that's what Max did, so he was he was in charge of security and transporting this. And of course, Ella was not allowed to know any of this, just as Sigma was not, not allowed to know any of what you were working on, right, Glenn? You, you ended up telling her as much as you could, but... Well, part of, it, part of their story, of Glenn and his wife, is the secrecy that they, he had to maintain about his job. And it put a strain on the puppet, because they couldn't talk to each other freely anymore. And that was part of what I think that got you started up interested in it too. That was that was a big part. And like I said, it's the human angle, the human yeah. side of these these stories that gets me. It's I want to get to the core of the relationship. Obviously, the circumstances are extraordinary. Uh, it's an extraordinary time, but I'm interested in what, and this is kind of how Jack pitched it to me initially too, was uh, how ordinary people rise to the occasion of these extraordinary circumstances. Well, and you say it's also the moral issue of, of the, the bomb itself. Absolutely. And um, we've talked about that a lot, both uh, with Glenn and 
privately and with you, right. whether or not that was a dreadful thing to do or whether it was a life-saving thing. Uh, one of our former residents here, Jim Vivers, always swore that the atomic bomb saved his life because he was in Europe, fighting in Europe. And was, when the European war was over and he was brought home, he was told he had six weeks leave and then he was going in on the invasion of the home islands of Japan. And he said, I knew that was it, right. that I would be a dead man. I lived all the way through Europe. I, my life would, would, was not, would run out. And he said goodbye to his wife and to everybody he knew. And the atomic bomb fell and the war was over like that. And he said, Glenn, pull him, save my life. And Jim, Jim would say that if he was here today. And that's the way a lot of people feel about something that other people say is a dread. It's dreadful, not on you. Well, I got to tell you, uh, um, our security was tight during that period of time, and um, you could not. I don't believe that with today's technology, I don't believe you could maintain the same degree of security. Oh, everybody would be twittering everybody during that period of time. Well, that was a fascinating story you told tonight when you went with a group of residents. Did anyone here go up to San Onofre on that trip to the, uh, uh, to, uh, to the Psalms? Uh, to the plant up there, and I remember Glenn, you telling me a story uh, about the docent who was there to, with your group, explaining how everything worked, and you sort of pulled her aside and said, is, is that been declassified? I didn't know. <laughs> that was one of the secrets that Glenn has had to carry for half a century here. And all of a sudden, he, this, this docent just casually mentions it in the conversation. And Glenn was still kind of guarded about it, you know, uh, and was unsure, but she said, yeah, that was the story. Incidentally, that same story, when I was talking to this uh, lady, it happened uh, that her father uh, worked at Oak Ridge at the same time I did. Of course, we never met, but uh, I run into a couple of coincidences uh, like that. What, what year did he arrive at Oak Ridge? What year did you come to Oak Ridge, Glenn? She wants to know. What? what was the year when you arrived at Oak Ridge? The year? Yeah, do you remember which year it was? 42? I, I remember it was like 19. <laughs> oh, that, was, that wasn't the law. <laughs> it was uh, 1943, and uh, the, uh, one of the ways I have of remembering that is that uh, uh, my wife and I were married in uh, April of 1943, and in June we headed off for Oak Ridge, Tennessee. Well, as, as the play about Glenn's life has evolved, it's changed a lot. It's no longer the story of a young couple and their relationship. It's much more geared toward, I think, in its present form, the moral questions involved and, and their, their concern about what they're doing. Would you want to talk about how your work evolves? Sure, of course. How many of you had a chance to come to the play reading that we did here a few months ago? There's I'm just people. curious, a few of you, the reading of the play that we did here in this room. Um, so those of you that came, it's already changed even since that version. So as a playwright, uh, there are many iterations of a piece, and you know, you can I can sit there typing in the dark by myself, but I can't play every part. I don't want to. I do not want that. That would be awful to you want that. Um, however, once you get it in front of an audience, that adds another dynamic because the audience, I like to consider an additional character in the piece, and it's how the audience reacts to it that, that gives you those clues as to, okay, this is working, this is not. Uh, there may even be a reading that an actor gives that you hadn't thought of. In fact, this happens many times. Sometimes they may be absolutely horrible, and you say, okay, well, that'll work with somebody else. But more often than not, what happens 
is that actor gives you insight into the character. And so the character and uh, you know the entire script evolve. The character will, will evolve. So I think we started off in, in a very uh, documentary style uh, where I took Glenn's story, I took Ella's story, I embellished a few things, uh, I dramatized a few things as you do. But it was still essentially their story. And I, would, I would honestly say it's still essentially Glenn's story, uh, even in its current form. But it has mutated to become something else. And in different drafts, uh, you know, sometimes Glenn's character is, is a bit more angry than Glenn normally is, <laughs> a little bit more irate, uh, has a lot less patience than Glenn has because it is a fictionalized version of him. And now I think, I, I completely agree with you, I think it has, has evolved into, okay, we've got this relationship between this couple, and it's not necessarily this couple starting out in life, it's this couple that's been together for a while, and they've been through uh, some pretty traumatic events, including uh, you know, the inception of World War II, but now they have these moral questions to wrestle. They have to wrestle those questions for themselves, they also have to wrestle those couples, uh, those couples, those questions as a couple, which are very different things sometimes, right? Um, and, and that is what I find fascinating as well, uh, is that internal push and pull, and then you have a partner who also is dealing with that, and how do you meet each other, and how do you, how do you either reconcile or and and and, and end, or how do you reconcile and overcome? Um, that's, that's the question. I think that's kind of the question of the piece now, not just for the, the two main characters, but also for the country at yeah. all time. And that's sort of what I'm trying to mirror uh, in their relationship. Um, Glenn, uh, the latest version that you've seen, how do you feel about you and the picture of you that the play gives? Is there anything that doesn't ring true to you or anything that you wish he'd put in, that he didn't put in? Anything that you wish he hadn't put in, that he did put in? I don't know how to answer that. I don't know how to answer that. All the above. Does it, does it seem like you, when you look at the stage, how does it feel watching your, your story on the stage? <clears throat> well, it's a highly emotional trip. Uh, the uh, <clears throat> the times uh, some of you folks uh, may or may not have uh, really realized what really happened during that era, and <clears throat> the reason I get emotional about it is because everything was uh, let's say intense. Everybody had uh, the same objective, uh, uh, get this uh, war over with. And the way that uh, the people of this, these United States were in lockstep with each other to, to get this over, and uh, the efforts we made was the greatest team that I think has ever been created. And that's the entire country. <clears throat> this is uh, one of the things that I'm hoping that uh, Lance will uh, bring forth in this. And that is that it's, it's not about me, it's about an era. And uh, how different that era is from the one that we're living in today. When you uh, stop to think that uh, when uh, all of this was happening at Oak Ridge, Tennessee, we had a raging war in Europe. And Japan was uh, on our heels in the Pacific. And the we were, we were making sacrifices every day in a lot of different areas. I'll just give you a few to, as a reminder because I'm sure you know about it, heard about it. 
that uh, there was serious rationing going on there. Uh, as a matter of fact, when my wife and I were married, uh, she came up to Berkeley from uh, Los Angeles with a suitcase, and I was living in a boarding house with uh, three other people, and uh, that's the way we started housekeeping, with a bear covered and uh, some uh, food ration stamps in our pocket. And that's the way we started out. And <clears throat> other rationing things were, uh, was, uh, in addition to food, it was gasoline, tires, and everything, even shoes. I even had a, for a pair of shoes. So this is kind of give you a flavor of, uh, of uh, the surface of what was going on. And then when you got behind the security screen and found out what we were doing militarily, uh, it's, uh, it really stretches your imagination to understand how we put it all together. And uh, it was, uh, it was a, a intense times. And uh, I'm not sure that some of our uh, later generations could put up with that. Uh, Glenn, the only thing I think of immediately that's comparable is 911. We are having the anniversary of it today, the 16th anniversary of the loss of the Twin Towers in New York and the way the country pulled together for several days. But it only lasted days, yeah, and during World War II, it lasted for four long years. But you're right, it, it was a unique time. And some of you, be glad, are too young to remember it well. Be glad what? Be glad that you're too young to remember it well. And those of us who are older geezers here, remember it very well. Don't be glad. In this play, did they talk about a typical day for him, like what he actually did from when he left the parking lot to when he returned to the parking lot? Yeah. Is he, I'd like to know what he did. What did he do? A typical day if there was such a thing. A typical day when you left the parking lot, there was no parking lot to walk towards. How many gates did you go through? How many cipher lines did you have? Talk about the security a little bit. They, they, when, when you left, when you went to work, yeah. what did you do? Well, well, you can't tell you. I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll, 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 I can't tell you. That's, that's, that's not allowed to talk about it. <laughs> well, I tell you, a typical day, uh, I'd uh, drive up to the uh, entrance to the, to the project. I would surrender my uh, resident badge and pick up a, uh, a key pass, a badge. Then as I went over to my work area, I surrendered that badge and got another one that wow. had all of my classified information on it. And uh, the, the, the system that was in effect at that time, there were several tiers of security. And, uh, <clears throat> Those of us that had uh, what is generally referred to as a Q clearance, we had a certain symbol on our badge and a certain number from one to four. And we could speak to anyone uh, with a four or below. There was a higher tier of fives, and those were the reserved for uh, doctors uh, Tyler and Lawrence and, and the uh, uh, special people like that. And uh, so it, uh, it was a good system and, and it worked. And there were many times uh, when I had to go into an area, I was in charge of a group. I didn't mention this, but when I left Berkeley, I took a group of four people with me uh, to operate the machine shop. And uh, they had a clearance uh, that was below mine, but uh, they, uh, <coughs> they 
working it out pretty well down there. They didn't work as many hours as I did, but, uh, but uh, I quite often had to leave my uh, area where my people were and go uh, particularly with, uh, with Dr. Lawrence and his uh, group and go in to uh, the area where the <coughs> radiation uh, was taking place. Because we were, the, the scientists would come with their scratch pads and they would have sketches that we were supposed to be able to make whatever they sketched out, which is pretty weird sometimes. <laughs> but uh, anyway, many times I had to go back into where the vacuum chambers were and take measurements so that I could make some equipment that would fit within the uh, parameters of the, of the chamber. So uh, many times I had to get into areas that was above even my classification. And uh, you ever, ever get radiated? You betcha. That's, that's why I live so long. <laughs> I think I've been radiated enough. <laughs> that's one of the stories that's uh, amazing to me is uh, Glenn talking about just sort of these scraps of paper with hastily drawn sketches on them and then Glenn has to extrapolate what he, I mean, just, he, he says, okay, well, maybe that's a seven eighths and I'll just file that into this and maybe that's a which part that goes into this. And there was, a, it seems like there was a lot of guesswork and a lot of trial and error uh, because of the time constraints, you know, the, the, the imminent danger of, do, what do the Germans know? How far along are the Germans? How far along are the Japanese? They could be as far as us. They could be even further along in their in their designs than us. And, and uh, it's that I think that's what you're talking about too. That urgency. Um, that that was it was everywhere. It was ubiquitous. So well, when they picked up yeah. Gordon von Braun in, in Europe and discovered that in fact they were not very far away from right from making the discovery, we had beat them but just barely. And it would be a vastly different world today if uh, we hadn't beaten them. Mm. Were you using uh, unfamiliar materials to machine, or were you using conventional materials? Materials and machines. Were they conventional, or, or were they different from what you were used to working with? No, we had uh, pretty conventional equipment. <clears throat> the distance of the high gear that has, has to do with the whole program, but one day they, I, um, I had told them what equipment, machine shop equipment, we had to have in order to meet their requirement. So one day they came to me and said, uh, we're going to take a trip. And uh, <clears throat> so, the next morning we headed out and we went to uh, Willow Run up in Michigan, which was a Ford uh, plant. And uh, they said, uh, you can have any piece of equipment that we have in here. And so I chose the, the equipment and I said uh, to uh, <coughs> people, I said, how soon can we get it down um, with the transportation range you get down there? And all they told me is, you'll be surprised. <laughs> and and uh, <clears throat> I, I was surprised how quickly uh, you can get things done uh, with the urgency is there. You know, that was just kind of an aside from uh, some of the other things. Well, it's all it's all interesting, even the little bits and pieces, like what kind of machinery you use and what the materials were. Oh. It's, it's what makes up the whole story. You call this ethnodrama? Uh, yes. Yeah, so the difference in this story, and I guess actually when I'm speaking to that very first draft that I did, it's almost uh, sort of interview theater, which the, the technical term is ethnodrama, where you are 
you are taking someone's words and you're creating a verbatim piece, a verbatim piece of theater out of it. So, uh, you know, I would have taken Glenn's exact words, including every any pause, any um that he puts into it, any uh, any stutter, any any intricacy of speech, and I would put that exactly into a script and have the person playing Glenn, who would be playing Glenn, do that. So that's ethno drama. What I did in that first piece was a little bit of that. But it was still more, you know, a fictionalized, bless you, a fictionalized version of Glenn, which obviously in this in this latest draft, which is, I think, officially the, I don't know, the fifth draft, maybe, but unofficially probably the ninety fifth or something like that, because I do, you know, I'll write and then I'll go back and then one scene will inform a previous scene and I'll say, oh well, that, now that changes this, so I got to go back and change that, or that gives me an idea for something later. Um, so now, you know, this version of Glenn, I think at his core, retains who Glenn is, I hope. That's my, that's my goal. Um, but again, he's, he's more abrasive than Glenn is. Glenn is not abrasive <laughs> at all. Glenn is very sweet. Um, and this version of Glenn, whose name is Sam in the play, is, uh, is a little more, yeah, a little more abrasive. So it's shifted away from that sort of ethnodramatic attempt well, in the first more, part. I think Sam, he, he, does, a he, 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 does, does, he does cuss a bit. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, still PG, I would say. Yeah, yeah. That's true. Um, I don't know what he was yeah. then, but I, I do feel that I have a pretty good sense of it, as much as I can, obviously. Um, just in the many conversations Glenn and I have had. People get nicer as they get older. People get nicer as they get older. Yeah, well, I'm on the other side of that trend. There are several of us here who speak yeah. A couple of examples of exceptions. Uh, while we're at, right at this juncture, I'd like to get to the commercial here, if I may. The commercial is that Lance wants to do a series of interviews with residents here and pick up a series of life stories. Because <coughs> I don't think there's anybody in this room who doesn't have an interesting story to tell. I've talked to a lot of you, and just a little bit and piece here and there. You're fascinating people. That's one of the most fascinating things about this place, is the people. Uh, you are so interesting, and you are so valuable. And just as Joyce and uh, Don have put you onto film or onto uh, recording for your families and your friends. I think Lance would like to pull together a series of life stories. And, and that's partly why we tricked you into coming here. <laughs> to see if there was anybody who was game enough to say, yeah, I'd talk to Lance, I'd tell him all about it. My divorce, or my, you know, no. whatever. <laughs> yeah, I, ideas come from everywhere, but the best ideas come from just talking to people. Honestly, as a writer, and also as an actor, I, I find that, that I get some <laughs> some pretty incredible characterizations. And I wonder where did I get that? And I say, oh yeah, it was this woman I was talking to who was telling me about owning a bagel shop, and she would throw bagels at people. I don't know. I'm completely making this up right now, but <laughs> but that's it's that kind of story where you don't know immediately where you got it from. Um, but as a writer, I obviously know exactly where I got it from, and, and Glenn's story is is so present in this. Um, but but again, Ella's story is in there as well. Uh, I would like Ella's to. Story pretty much dropped out of the play, though. Uh, yeah, so it would be a separate story if you write it. Exactly. A series, a series of life stories as a novel or as a series of books or as a series of one act plays, whatever you decide to do with it, exactly. that one will be there. Definitely. Uh, and all these stories, if, if you talk to me, uh, the interesting thing is even if I fictionalize it, even if I, I take it in a different direction, uh, the important thing to me, and I know the important thing uh, to Jack and Valerie, who are responsible for this residency, is preserving the stories preserving them in any way we can, because stories are ephemeral in a way. Um, you know, you tell me something and, and it's here with us, between the two of us,
But if I write it down, then it can be forever. Granted, we have the oral tradition and people will continue to tell these stories, um, but writing it down is another way to get that out. And, and that's important to me as well. That's uh, got Ziegler's story. What's that? That's got Ziegler's story. No. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not telling. I think Jack's going to put together the list. <laughs> No, but if you are interested and you don't mind me taking your story uh, and then creating something out of it, I would love to do that. I would love to talk to you. And if you're not comfortable with me using your story, that's fine too. I'd still love to talk to you. Yeah. I, I, well, I a lot of people say my story. stories aren't worth you know, telling separately as a separate it is. Yeah. yeah. Even just anecdotes from the Harveys know because they listen to a lot of these when they recorded them, as I say, for, for family and friends, which is one of the worthiest projects that's been done around here. And I really think that all of you ought to volunteer. But tell us about it. Were you embarrassed or upset when you told everything to, to Lance? Did, did, did it bother you? Did, did it bother you to talk freely to Lance? Oh, yeah. It, oh, yeah. <laughs> You're not helping me. See, he's honest. <laughs> no. Well, I didn't know uh, when, when, I, when Lance approached me. Uh, I didn't know uh, I didn't know whether I wanted to do it or not. Uh, I guess. Uh, one of the reasons uh, I hesitated a little bit was, uh, uh, well, frankly, uh, I've never been debriefed. And, uh, but I, I realize that the public now probably knows more than I uh, held back all of these, these times. But it was just something that was ingrained in me that is not something I should be talking about. Well, not time. all of us have that problem. <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's a very unique problem that yeah. you were told not to talk about. It. Yeah. yeah, well, I'll tell you how tight the security was and how conscientious my wife and I were. Uh, my wife was approached uh, at Oak Ridge and said, we need somebody with your background to uh, arrange transportation. And she said, uh, well, I think I can handle that. Then I should uh, you know, telephone operator and some other uh, things. And, and, uh, and incidentally, she aspired to the stage for your information. Right? But anyway, her job was to arrange the transportation for uh, people like uh, the Dr. Tellers and the Dr. Lawrence's and Dr. Oliphant from Great Britain and places like this. And uh, she, uh, all I ever got from her was that uh, the, the biggest problem was routing because they never routed the same people uh, if they were coming in at the same time, they were never running the same uh, sequence or the same uh, destination point and all of that. Now these are things she told me uh, afterwards. And once in a while, I would mention uh, something about, uh, oh, you got that new scientist in there today, Dr. Olafan. And I uh, said, so do you know anything about that? And she would change the subject. <laughs> uh, I thought she was being sneaky, but I guess I was. <laughs> uh, yes. But that was that was a type of security, and that was the dedication that uh, people had uh, for um, safety security at that time. Okay, did Glenn? I'm just asking you because because there are here problems. Did Glenn tell the of what he was getting into when he came to Oak Ridge, or was it a gradual learning She wants to know whether you knew when you went to Oak Ridge the scope of what you were getting into, or where you gradually became aware of it. 
No, I, all I do is that uh, at Berkeley I was working on a pretty high classified operation. So I expected to be on the same level as I approached uh, Oak Ridge. But I didn't know that there were uh, that many uh, higher levels of security. And uh, uh, because I was to take uh, certain uh, skills with me down there, I had a hunch that we were uh, working on something uh, pretty out of the ordinary. Because uh, at Berkeley, uh, I was working on the uh, big cyclotron in the radiation laboratory. It's, uh, if you've never heard of it, the uh, cyclotron there was uh, the big one. It was a 184-inch diameter uh, magnet. And uh, we performed all kinds of uh, radioactive experiments in that. So I had a natural curiosity about what I might be getting into down there. I thought maybe they even had a bigger shot than John. <laughs> they did. <laughs> <laughs> Other people may have questions. Um, we don't need to cut you on the conversation. We'd like to get you in, as a matter of fact. What are you planning to do with this? What's your next step, step for what you're doing with Glenn's story? Book. That's a great question. Um, so, <laughs> the nature of show business is uh, is uh, tenuous. It's a, it's a, you know, you think you've got something going here, and then something happens, and it shifts. So, the next step is a another workshop of it. So, the workshop being uh, actors in a room with a director. Uh, I'm in the room. I'm working with them. As we're rehearsing, we're essentially rewriting. I'm essentially rewriting. Uh, although, again, I, I welcome input from the actors, not too much, because actors can mm, they get, they get, they get a little bit too big for the bridges. But uh, they have good ideas, mainly working with the director and talking uh, to her. It's Lisa Berger, who was here, if you, again, you were here at the reading. Um, she was here as well, uh, the reading that we had here. So it's a more in-depth process, and that's coming up in January, right over across the train tracks here at New Village Arts. Uh, beyond that, I have just been in contact with different contacts that I have, either as a writer or an actor around town, and you know, just dropping lines in the water and, and essentially trying to get some bites on it. Uh, I know I would, I would love to see it fully produced. I feel like a work is never done, I always want to tinker with a play, so I always want to keep rewriting. But I do feel it's at the point now where it needs to get up on its feet, it needs to be presented in front of an audience, and uh, I, I feel that it's ready for that. Uh, even beyond the workshop, I think the workshop is going to be good and we'll get some good work done, but then I think it'll be ready for that next step of a full production, and that's the goal. That's, that's the ultimate uh, goal for me anyway. I, I want. I want this story out on stage, you know, in front of as many people as possible. Pretty good. Can, does Glenn, is he able to comment about the personalities of the <coughs> physicists like Niels Bohr and E.O. Lawrence and Edward Teller? Does he, yeah, did he, he have does, enough contact? And he's also a little bit about the guys, Edward Teller and Niels Bohr and some of those people that you met. What were they like? Talk about Teller's laugh that you told me about. So here he says. No, no. What would they like personally? You you run, ran into them. None of us have ever met any of them. And they're really famous names. People that you knew. I'm having so much trouble with the acoustics in there. Sure. It, that's right. Um, if I can kind of sear it a little bit. So, so Edward Teller, one of the stories you told me about Dr. Teller, was him playing piano oh, yeah. in that big house. Could you talk more about that? Yeah, uh, Dr. Teller was, uh, <laughs> was uh, quite a talented person. He was, uh, uh, he had a piano. Uh, and 
he, uh, of course, put in a lot of hours in the lab, but he did some of his better thinking, he said, when he was uh, tinkering around on the piano. But he chose always to do that about between the hours of two and four in the morning. <laughs> and he played loud. <laughs> Just as an aside, talk about Dr. Teller. He, he turned out to be one of my favorite people. And uh, Dr. Teller had a speech impairment. But after talking to him for probably two minutes, you forgot about the uh, speech impairment because he was so interested. Whatever he talked about was interesting. And in later years, this was after, uh, after Oak Ridge, but I was uh, working at Los Alamos, New Mexico, and <clears throat> Dr. Teller uh, was putting in quite a lot of time there. And one of the things that Dr. Teller would do, uh, just sort of almost on the spur of the moment, you get the word around that he was going to tell stories to the kids. And at Los Alamos, New Mexico, I was up there at a time when uh, it was uh, less uh, modern than it is today. And uh, we had an old barracks building that, that uh, we used as a library. And over in one end of the library, <coughs> He would uh, set up, and he had a, little, had a little stool he found someplace there in the library. And he would sit there, and these kids would all circle around, sitting on the floor. Uh, and uh, at that time, my, my daughter was about four years old, four or five years old. And he would sit there and tell these stories. And those kids would sit there with our eyes booked open like that. And he would sit there and do that for up to an hour or an hour and a half. And those kids never moved to Boston. They were fascinating. So. Fascinating. How about Nils Bohr? Did you meet him? You met Nils Bohr? No? Well, that's just the name of it. Jack threw at me, so I thought I'd throw it at you. I don't think he heard. How about Oppenheimer? Neil, Niels Bohr, do you have any good Niels Bohr stories? Well, Wasn't he in Denmark at the time? Yeah. I think at that time he was in Denmark. In 43, yeah. Oppenheimer. Well, Niels Bohr, uh, he was a brilliant scientist. But he was a pain in the butt to look at. There you go. <laughs> Why is that, Glenn? What did he do? Arrogance. Uh, just, just, just arrogance. And, uh, it was, uh, as we would say uh, modernly, it's, it's my way or the highway. You know? We always like to hear that famous people are humble and pleasant. We don't like to hear about them. How about Oppenheimer? Dr. Lawrence, uh, uh, that I've mentioned many times here. Uh, Lawrence Liverpool. I, uh, I met him when I joined the uh, radiation laboratory in Berkeley. And I joined the laboratory there in 1942. And Dr. Lawrence had won the Nobel Prize in, uh, for splitting the atom in 1937. And uh, so I worked shoulder to shoulder with him um, at uh, Berkeley. And uh, uh, he told me quite a number of things about the evolution uh, working up to the big cyclotron that they had. The first one was a tiny laboratory model that he could hold in his hand. The second one was uh, the magnet was uh, 
12 or 13 inches of diameter. The next one, they stepped up to 37 inches. They developed the next one, a 60 inch, and that one was devoted entirely to uh, get into uh, uh, atomic medicine. Because Dr. Lawrence's brother was a medical doctor in San Francisco. And uh, so there was a big evolutionary uh, story there. And then they went on up to the uh, large cyclotron that uh, <clears throat> I worked on most of the time. I'll give you just one little aside if you bear with me on that. I mentioned a 37 inch cyclotron. In later years, after I was away from the university, and I went on to other things in the Los Angeles area, uh, I got a call and said, uh, you know, we're going to move the 37-inch cyclotron from the Berkeley campus to the Los Angeles campus. And, uh, would you be interested in uh, working on the project? And uh, so I sat down with the uh, people that were designing the building. This was a small building, but it was uh, across the street from the physics uh, uh, laboratory building on the UCLA campus. And uh, so I worked with them, and uh, we brought down the 37-inch cyclotron, I supervised the assembly of the cyclotron and, and uh, the firing it up and uh, away we went on another uh, nuclear uh, exploration. You make it sound so simple. Other questions? Oppenheimer. How about Oppenheimer? Oppenheimer. That's, a, that's oh, a great yeah. Yeah. Oppenheimer. Frank and Bob. Well, Let's start out talking about the Oppenheimers uh, from a different uh, perspective for a moment. Uh, Los Alamos, New Mexico sits on five mesas up in the, uh, up above Santa Fe. It's up at an elevation of uh, 8,200 feet. Air is a little thinner up there. But anyway, on one of the mesas, uh, was a Boy Scout Lodge. It was quite a nice uh, Boy Scout Lodge. And uh, that was uh, sitting on property owned by the Oppenheimer family. And uh, <clears throat> so uh, they always, they used to spend their vacation time in the summers and all up there. Uh, and that's the property that became Los Alamos and the National Laboratories. Well, anyway, on the uh, getting back to Berkeley, uh, I got acquainted with both uh, Robert, uh, which was the elder, and uh, Frank. And I worked mostly with Frank Oppenheimer. And uh, he was. Uh, very dedicated to the to the project, and he was a, a little bit on the demanding side, but he was also understanding. Now, once in a while, we get into these experiments where, uh, <clears throat> once you started the experiment into cyclotron and got the cycle going, uh, you had to continue, or that you would have a failed project. And sometimes everything didn't go quite according to plan. And uh, on one occasion, uh, the one I remember best, uh, Frank Oppenheimer and I worked for 32 hours straight. And uh, I was one tired pup when I got through the valley. And, uh, but, uh, his wife would uh, come up and bring him a clean shirt and another pack of cigarettes, and away we go. <laughs> and, uh, and so uh, 
Anyway, um, they were, I enjoyed working with them. I, I, I worked, for some reason or other, uh, I, I have a lot of respect for their, uh, their doctorate and what they did to earn it and what they did after they received their doctorate in the laboratory, hands on. They also appear to have uh, respect for my talent in being able to carry out the, uh, uh, the things that they needed in the laboratory. They could express only the sketches, uh, but I was able to convert those into some hardware uh, that uh, they could use in their experiments. And, uh, so that's sort of the Oppenheimer uh, relationship I had uh, with them. And Frank Oppenheimer appears in the latest version. Did you take Bob out? I have taken Bob out. There are uh, a number of reasons for that. I think dramatically it, it streamlines the play. It gets us uh, from point A to B, not necessarily more quickly, but, but uh, more focused, if that makes any sense. Um, where I, I'm trying to take anything extraneous out, uh, lest you think it's story serving entirely. It's also uh, <laughs> it's also sometimes easier to get a play produced when there are less characters in the play. Uh, there's there's this the, right. There's this tendency now uh, to have three character plays, four character plays. Uh, uh, you know, it's kind of, I've seen both versions, and I, I must say, when we had Bob and Frank in there, it was very confusing. I agree, and again, I, I, I've got the realistic side of it, but I also think it serves the story. I really do. I'm not being, I'm trying not to be overly flippant about it. But, uh, but yes, I think taking those elements out and really getting to what is the core of the story, what's the spine, how is it going to get us, uh, how is it going to propel us? from point A to point B through this, not only this time period, but this particular story, like we said, of this, this sort of moral conundrum uh, that's going on inside our characters. How long is this play? How long is the play? Uh, in its current form, uh, I think our first act was running about 50 minutes, and I think act two is down to about 48 minutes. So it's under two hours. <laughs> is that good or bad? That's good. That's good. Okay, I try. I do my best um, to keep to keep things as long as they need to be and not overindulge. Although obviously, you know, earlier drafts tend to be longer because you're trying to throw everything in the kitchen sink in. Doctor Sanders back there has a question. Then you whittle it down. Yes. For Glenn, what portion of the project was done in Los, uh, in uh, Oak Ridge, and what portion was done in Chicago? For his involvement? The Manhattan Project. Okay. Which which portion of the Manhattan Project were you involved in? Were you all in Oak Ridge? Or were you in Chicago? Were you in Hanford? Were you in Los Alamos? Is that the question? Well, at that time, uh, uh, there was uh, the Berkeley Radiation Lab, the Manhattan Project. Uh, Chicago, of course, was involved. Uh, you probably uh, remember or heard uh, the uh, <laughs> carbon pile they had at the stadium in uh, Chicago. And, uh, so we had some relationship with that. Well, you, you, you met Enrico Fermi as well, briefly, oh, yeah. oh. Uh, who was responsible for the Chicago pile. Right. Was this all going on at the same time, Glenn? No. Uh, I, I, um, Pretty much, pretty much uh, kind of a series, this opening series. Somebody had to tell you a story about it, I believe, I don't know, Fermi. Go ahead. Yeah, we're listening. Go ahead. And who are you on? You want it now? Okay. <clears throat> this uh, doesn't have anything to do with the Manhattan Project. This was of a later time. Uh, at the Los Alamos, and uh, 
management came to me one day and said, uh, you know, uh, are you aware that Enrico Fermi's father uh, ran a machine shop over in Italy? I've forgotten the name of the little town in Italy. And uh, Enrico Fermi uh, learned
uh, but it does become its own thing. It becomes larger than the initial story, and you have many collaborators. So an actor will bring an idea and say, you know what, I, I'm really, this line's not ringing true for me, can I change it to this? Or, I see this line, and the intention might be that this person is angry with the other person, but I really think he's, he's more hurt. Can I play it that way? And then that will inform the way the director directs. But, but that's generally the relationship. Uh, the writer, if the writer has any notes, will go to the director, will not go directly to the actors. Sometimes I overstep my bounds as a writer, especially during a workshop production. When you're in rehearsals, uh, and the relationship that I have with this director, she wants me to, to interject when I have a thought. Uh, most directors, though, that I've worked with, they don't, they don't want that. You have to respect their process because it is their piece, you know? Uh, that's, that's my I've heard, I've heard many directors say that the writer should deliver the script and then go down himself. <laughs> don't want to talk to the it anymore. Right, it's, it is a rare thing in theater nowadays to have what I have with this director where she is actively engaged in soliciting my opinion. Most of the time it is exactly that. As a director, don't ever let an actor say, that isn't the way I would say it, because you're saying that you're not that character. The way the character would say it. Yeah. Right. So the director does have the ultimate say. Even when the director is wrong. Yes. The director's the wife, right? Well, I mean, it just, you know, it all depends on the relationship. So that's what I would say. Okay, once more, we are, we are coming close to an end. Before we end, let me encourage you to talk to Lance and kind of let him know if you would be at all interested in, in, in sharing your own story with him. I think he'd be very pleased and very grateful. But some people are, are getting rested. So I thought I'd get that last commercial that we've already played. I just want to know uh, who are the actors and how are they selected? That's a good question. The question was, uh, who are the actors and how are they selected? Well, um, I, I would be honest with you and say it depends on your budget. <laughs> you know, um, if, if you're working, uh, let's, let's say at a college level, you sort of have an embarrassment of riches because you've got a large pool from which to choose. Uh, if you're doing a workshop, it may not pay a lot, uh, and then maybe it's not a union production and you have non-union actors who will be paid less uh, and you don't have as deep a pool. So it just kind of depends. Uh, other ways, the, the ways that I primarily select actors, especially for this, and again, it's more of the director, I kind of submit a wish, lit, a wish list and then it's whatever the director decides to cast with her vision. Uh, but generally, you'll, you'll post an audition notice, you'll have auditions, you'll have a list of actors that you, that you kind of call from that and then say, okay, these are the actors we want to see, and you start pairing them up uh, with each other, and from there, you make your final decisions. A lot of times what happens is it's, there's an actor that the director and I have both worked with before, and we say, wouldn't this person be great in this role? We hear that person read. Uh, a lot of times informally, we'll just have coffee with them and, and talk about the character and say, what do you think about this? How would you view this character? How would you play this character? And then if we get a good feeling from that, then it's pretty much just a direct offer. And, and that happens quite a bit, whether, no matter what budget level you're at. You know, a lot of people, they like working with the people they like working with. If, if someone's fun to work with, you want that person, even more so when they're talented. <laughs> you know, um, someone who's talented but is a pain, uh, you can work with them, but it's, it's not as much fun. If you, if you can find someone who's talented and fun to work with, that's what you're going to go with. Our batteries are running out, so I'm going to encourage you to talk to these two guys in person. I'm going to call the general session to an end. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.